Okay, so good morning and welcome to today's webinar on working safely for service industry businesses. Um, this is one of several sector specific um, uh, webinars that we've been running. We've got some uh, really good speakers today to share, share their experiences and tips. Um, before, we, uh, before we get going, some basic housekeeping uh, on how today's going to run. We can't hear or see you, so don't worry about any background noise, but we do still want you to interact by using the Q&A button. And that they're both at the, uh, they're at the bottom of the screen rather than the chat function, please. And also, uh, just to let you know, this is being recorded and uh, so we'll be putting this up on our website shortly. So, introduction to our uh, uh, speakers today. Firstly, we've, we have uh, Harriet Roberts from Warrington Bid, which uh, for those of you who don't know is, is a business improvement district. Um, and she has some uh, really good slides to share and some, and some very good intel. Then we have Katie Robinson, who is, uh, uh, runs the nail spa in Chester and also involved in a heating and engineering and plumbing business. And then we have Stephen Wonkey from Taste Cheshire, uh, an organization that works with bars, restaurants, cafes, food producers across Cheshire, and, and works to promote Cheshire's food and drink offering. So a really good spread of, of speakers today. Um, and then just very quickly to introduce myself, um, it's Mark Shepherd. And uh, I work for Cheshire and Warrington Growth Hub, which is part of the Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, we, uh, what I really wanted to do is just give you a quick summary of the, what we've uh, been busy doing during this uh, uh, challenging COVID-19 period. So uh, we've been making sure that businesses are fully informed on, on the support packages that are available. So that's government, uh, central government and on a local level. Um, engaging with businesses to help them. Uh, so wide range of things, for example, accessing grants, understanding the furlough process, loans and, and lots of other types of support that's been available, but maybe hasn't been that easy to access. Uh, we've been uh, engaging businesses with our survey, trying to understand how businesses in the area have been impacted. And then we feed that back to central government and, and then try to make sure that those support packages meet business needs. So that continuous feedback is really important. Um, Updating the website on a daily basis, which means you have fresh, accurate data uh, for, for, and, it, and you can be reassured that it's um, that it, there's no fake news in there. Uh, trying to make sure that our businesses are fully informed and kept up to date uh, so they have the best chance to carry on through the crisis. Um, and then recently we've changed focus in the, into helping businesses as they plan to get back um, uh, working and running a business. And that is going to be a bit of a focus today as well. Um, so I think uh, hopefully that sums up uh, the, the growth hub and, and who I am. Um, I think uh, rather than uh, go any further, I think we need to get over to our speakers. And I'd like to introduce now Harriet Roberts from Warrington Bid, who um, she's going to be talking about how the bid's been involved in the town centre recovery strategy with all their stakeholders. So over to you, Harriet. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for all your support over the last few weeks um, in, in Warrington in helping us to get the information quickly and accurately to all our members across the town centre. So um, what we've been doing is very much leading a stakeholder-wide approach to the recovery of the town centre um, with a, a priority focus on getting up to speed in making it a safe environment across the whole of the um, town centre. So for a visitor coming back into Warrington, they will not know the difference often between what is private space, privately owned space like Bolton Square or Cockhead or, or Times Square and the public realm areas in the, in the town centre. And we felt it was really important that it, we got the stakeholders all around the table so we could understand where everybody was what they were thinking and what they were doing and in order to um, gain that level of respect and to get people around the table we have used um, the uh, Institute of Place Management's framework for town centre recovery so if you look at the next slide this is a piece of work that's being led by um, Manchester 
uh, Metropolitan University and the Institute of Place Management with the BID Foundation, working with an organisation called the uh, Association of Town and City Management um, in order to provide a tried and tested uh, uh, framework for this piece of work that other towns are doing. So you can see the four stages that we're working with here, that the first few weeks have been into crisis and we're now well into pre-recovery and um, moving into the recovery period. And on the next slide, you can see how that has developed even over the last few um, weeks in terms of how that framework is being um, fed by what's actually happening at grassroots level um, in the towns and cities across the UK and internationally as well. So um, we were able to go to the council and the other stakeholders and say, this is this is how we think it should work and within that we've got some priorities ourselves so um, we have split our group of stakeholders into three different themes um, and these are safety um, as a priority because ultimately people are going to come back into Warrington if it is a safe healthy place um, the second theme is storytelling and that's about communicating the message and the third one is about sustainability and that's about how we support the businesses and make them successful going forward and out of this. So uh, alongside that framework, we were also able to feed the council with some grassroots um, intelligence as well with what was happening with businesses. So if you look on the next slide, um, this is a, one example of a street in Warrington that you might think wouldn't have much of an issue and um, that perhaps it's got little footfall on a normal day. And so why would you need to worry about safety in this area? So this is Sankey Street, for those of you that know Warrington, um, and these are the types of units that are on that particular street. And if you look at the next slide, um, you can see some of the issues that we've got. So this is the corner of Sankey Street. There's a baker's that's been open throughout the lockdown period um, as an essential service. Next to there, you can just catch, it's got the, uh, the charity shop, and then after the charity shop, you've got another baker's, into the games workshop area, which hasn't been open over the last few weeks, but the next slide shows you that the next door along is a Polish supermarket. So very quickly, even in the last few weeks, we've got issues around um, queuing in that pedestrianised street, and it's feeding this information in uh, to the wider planning that's going on by the council and traffic management and so on. Further up the street, if you just have a look what some of the issues, um, which make it quite complicated. If you can have a look at the next slide, you should be able to see. Can you see that one? The bank, the NatWest Bank is the next door along. Um, queuing, obviously. So they're all kind of very quickly becoming quite congested with just a, a few people allowed into these units. And then the last stage of that street, you'll see the issue around um, Antisocial behaviour potentially, Holy Trinity Church on the corner of Sankey Street there, a uh, regular um, homeless person that sits on that, on that step. So we were able to emphasise really early on in this process, we need to get around the table, we need to be talking together, council linked up with Cock Edge, linked up with Golden Square, with the market, we need a consistent approach to how we're going to manage this distancing. Um, and we've been able successfully to do that. So uh, if the next slide that you look at is the distancing um, measures that are going into Golden Square with a view to it reopening um, fully on Monday the 15th. And we were able to look at that branding and, and uh, encourage all stakeholders to use a similar messaging. You'll notice that Golden Square have got an important message there, respect others. So we, we, they want it to be about being kind uh, as, as well as being safe, um, because a lot of it is going to be down to common sense and asking people to um, uh, use their common sense in areas where you can't actually put in measures to keep people in a one way uh, system. And, you, and the next slide shows how the council have adapted this message and they are using a stay safe stay left message and they've removed the two meter rule so that it's got a bit of longevity about it as that two meter rule may may change so that's our say that's what we've been doing in terms of um, supporting a strategic approach to recovery of the town center and the safety side of things 
Um, and then we've also been trying to get into the hearts and minds of consumers as well and what their attitude is going to be in terms of whether they're going to come back into the town. So the next slide shows uh, some of the PR we've been doing around a consumer survey and um, later I can share some of the results of that and, and where we think people's priorities have changed and their values have altered as a result of coronavirus. And then finally, um, we've been looking at um, ways that we can support um, the marketing, so a communications recovery strategy, an interim message that um, relaunches our destination brand. So not the next slide, but the next slide shows you what is happening, which is our new place brand identity, which we will relaunch. The next slide on from that. Um, we'll relaunch in the next two weeks with a, an interim campaign, which is about getting people to have confidence in the town, um, to show the town coming back to life, and to share some of the personalities and the um, communi community values that Warrington um, is special for, shall we say. Thank you, Harriet. That's, uh, it's great to see that sort of that level of support, on, um, especially at, at, at the local level. Um, you know, people um, could arguably, you know, been hardest hit by this, uh, by the crisis as well, with small businesses, local businesses. Um, and then, obviously, you, you know, you've, you're putting a very positive slant on it there, which is, the, you know, highlighting opportunities as well as, as well as these challenges. So, thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll come back for, uh, if you have any questions for, for Harriet, we'll come back to those soon. But uh, I think next we're going to go to, gonna go to uh, Katie Robinson from the Nail Spa. Um, hello, Katie. Um, hello. Hi, sorry. Hello. Hi, Katie. We can see you. Oh, good. Okay. Can hear you. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, where, where, to, where to start? I'm not sure um, where to start, really. I, my name's Katie. I am co owner of the Nail and Beauty Spa in Chester. Uh, actually in Hall just outside Chester and I also own a plumbing and heating business with my husband so two very different businesses um, affected both very differently with what's been happening over the last few weeks and now working towards thinking about how we're going to reopen obviously safely and successfully hopefully um, I was only asked yesterday about coming on today, so unfortunately I haven't, I haven't prepped a great deal about um, for this morning, but was more interested from my point of view in sharing obviously what we're doing and trying to pick up some information from other people about moving forward as well. Um, our biggest worry at my salon now, obviously moving forward, is that people will have the confidence to come back in um, and use us as they did before. We, the trading methods that we had before are absolutely unachievable moving forward. So I don't know if any of you know much about how nail salons work, but very much between four members of staff, we would have potentially eight or 12 clients in during that time some of them waiting some of them being prepped by apprentices some of them being done and now we'll be dropping that down to um one client an hour per therapist and three therapists in at any one time i've had to take desks out so obviously our biggest concern really is future viability of the business and and how it's going to remain trading um my other uh, other arm, my husband's business is a plumbing and heating business. Uh, he's managed to keep continuing trading through this, obviously doing emergencies only. Now moving forward, things are looking at changing in his business in Chester. A lot of our work there is around um, students and student accommodation. The big thing for us now will be whether or not the university advised students to go ahead in September with online lectures because if they do that's going to massively affect the um, student landlord business in Chester as well so these are these are my two areas of concern at the moment ok 
Okay, thank you. Um, I think that, that that that's a real. Can you see me now? <laughs> I that's can't a... see, but I can hear you. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um, it, it's it's these these genuine challenges. It, it's uh, that when you said that the future viability of the business, that really brings it home. I think a lot of people relate to that. Um, Okay, um, and then um, just a, the same sort of thing. If uh, we could speak to um, we speak to Stephen from Taste Cheshire. Morning, Mark. Good morning, um, Mark. Just for those who don't know, Taste Cheshire, um, we're an organisation started about ten years ago to represent the small and independent food and drink, be it producer, retailer. Um, market trader, whatever it might be. We run events as well, big events like the food and drink festival that would have happened this Easter at the uh, race course, but didn't for obvious reasons. We've postponed that until the end of August and we doubt whether that will be happening either, but it's there for the moment in case things work. What we've been doing during the lockdown period is try and find as much information as we can for the people who are members. We're a member organization who have restaurants, pubs, cafes, bars, etc., who are all uh, members of our organization. Um, we've been trying to find out information for them and continue to represent them. We also have 18,000 people that we email to every week who are foodies who go to our website to find out where they can go for something to eat, where they can find who's doing takeaway at the moment, who is available to do farm shop stuff, um, et cetera, et cetera, and be a communication conduit between all the parties. And with that in mind, and some of the questions that Katie raised and that Harriet touched on, if I just share a few things that I think might help this morning. We did a survey of 1,200 of our regular viewers to our website. They all, 1,200 responded out of the 18,000. And what we discovered was that 82.5% of them suggested as, sorry, this is the businesses first, 82.5% of our members who have businesses have had no revenue since the lockdown at all. Now, the government's put things in place for that. Only 2.5% had about 50% revenue and 12% were able to find a way to do some takeaway food. Most have been able to furlough their staff and that's been very, very good. And we'll all be aware that the Chancellor has just put in the ability to do a part furlough, part opening. That's going to be very important for the reasons that Katie raised. Whilst we believe that our members will be able to open, their numbers are going to be severely inhibited, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, we also had um, a lot of people have been able to get access to the grants, and all credit to Cheshire West and Chester, they were very quick to get money out to people who were desperately in need of it. That was very good. Cheshire East, a little slower, took Warrington, were very good. Um, we also had a concern when reopening comes about that cash flow is going to be terribly difficult for our members. They have no stock now. They probably weren't able to pay their suppliers right up to date because income finished straight away. Staff are on furlough. Many of them may not be able to come back if they're students who aren't here now because the university population, many of them have gone home. So that's the difficult parts of the business and reopening it. But we then surveyed our customers to find out what's your view on when we open. And you'll be really encouraged to know 86.9% said they would come out again to pubs, restaurants and cafe if the government's eased the measures and the venues had safety measures in place. We pushed them a little further and said, what does that look like? What if people were wearing masks? What if they were cleaning tables regularly? What if you had a one in, one out system? What if you could only book? What if it was only table service? That reduced it a little bit, but was still almost 80% of people said, not bothered, we want to get out. So that was very, very encouraging. We also asked the question, because a lot of people have been eating and drinking from home. And so we asked the questions around, well, have you decided that you might prefer to stay at home and do things now? and because it's cheaper, or et cetera. And there was less than 11%, it was 10.4% of people said, yes, I might stay at home and do not go out as often as I did. So it was overwhelming that the public want to go out and do these things. And anybody who saw the queues for Kentucky Fried Chicken at their drive-through, 
in Chester recently will know that um, people are very desperate to get out and do just about anything. So um, for Harriet and, and certainly for the people in Chester as well, I really think that your day one, two, three, and four of handling the people who come back in just because they want to go out is going to be very, very difficult. However, we've also put together a series of things just to remind people what it is that you're going to have to do and remember that it is your job. And, and there really is no point moaning about the fact, oh, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be this. Those who work at it and do it well are going to make a lot of money. Yes, if you're in the restaurant or cafe business, you might have to say, right, I've got two sittings. You can only stay for this long. People will understand it. Yes, you're going to have to dress slightly differently in the way that you present yourself and your, um, your staff, but it'll work. So you're going to have to do a risk assessment, and that's the first thing. There are lots of guides. I will provide one, which is a very good piece of work being done by the um, UK hospitality industry, and we'll make that available later. You've got to be aware of your staff, whether or not they do or don't have coronavirus. They shouldn't be anywhere near it if they were living with anybody. That's fairly obvious, but they need briefing regularly. Return to work interviews that you're going to need to do. Survey the staff to find out about them. Um, identify those that can't get there. Uh, keep reviewing their fitness to work. And then look at your workplace for your staff. Where are the areas that they go to regularly that need cleaning down, et cetera, et cetera. There's quite a list of it. It's not terribly <laughs> difficult. A lot of it's common sense. And it will be something that everybody can do. No matter what the business is, you'll find a way to do it. There's a lot of work being done by a lot of people. Um, I would also recommend what we've done at Taste Cheshire is, for those who deal with the public and take orders, we found a Cheshire and Liverpool company called Qbunk, a bit of a silly name, but a terrific product. And we've got them to agree that for the first 200 people who go to their, to their platform, they'll do that totally for free for six months, which is that you will have upload your menu, whether it be your drinks or your food menu onto their website under your business's name. People will come into your place, sit down, go to their phone, find your place, They'll order and pay from their phone. You will get a little printout at the till and that'll tell you that you've got to do that order and take it to the table. It's one less transaction that's necessary. That is absolutely brilliant. It's called Qbunk. We also found another Chester and Cheshire based company called MetLab. They've been supplying the um, industry, the uh, medical industry for since 1985. And they've put together a dedicated site specifically for the hospitality trade or anybody who deals with the public. And there are all the equipment you need for your staff and for your customers to be safe. And that's uh, at metlabppe.co.uk. And we put that together and there's a discount code for that as well. So if you go to the Taste Cheshire site, there's a tab PPE suppliers. All of these are on there. We found them. There are special deals and codes for people as well. So that's just a very quick overview of the kind of stuff we've been doing. And we're really gearing up now to say to people, now is the time. If you think you're going to need it, start ordering now because when everybody opens, everybody will want it. And now's the time to do the work and make sure that you're ready because the appetite for people to go out and use your products is 100% there. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. That is uh, that, some great stuff there. I mean, uh, Qbunk sounds really interesting. Um, I, hadn't I haven't heard anything about that. Not yes, Mark, they're a, they're a Cheshire and Liverpool-based company as well. And yeah. they're very relatively new. We've tested the product. First 200, you've got to put a code on called TC200, but then you will get the use of the product for six months. If you decide after that you don't want to use it, absolutely fine. They'll, yeah. they'll take yeah. it, turn it off, and that's it. These are the things, yeah, these are the things we need to, everybody needs to know about, be aware of. Um, and then the, so it's, it's these sort of, you know, proactive approach and, and these sort of solutions are, are great to hear about. Um, and then some of those stats as well, you know, 82%, uh, that's, that's, that is challenging. It, it, um, it really surprised us, Mark, to be honest, because 
a lot of members that we'd spoken to, our owners, were very worried that, you know, we don't want to look like a lab when we come back out again. We're meant to be a mm -hmm. nice place for hospitality. Yeah. And yet yeah. the public overwhelmingly said, we don't care. We get it. We know what it's like. And a lot of this is going to be down to people not just doing it in terms of all of the uh, risk assessment details, but actually being seen to be doing it. People can see you're going that extra yard. It makes them feel safe. Now, there's going to also be an issue around the age groups. We also know the older age group who control something like, I think it's 82% or just over 80% is of our wealth in the country is controlled by those over 50. Now, as they get older, of course, and disposable income, they're going to be a little more concerned because they start to get towards the risk group. So the younger ones are going to come out with less concern. There's also a big concern from people, and I, you're going to have to be careful the way you manage it if you sell alcohol, because it's all well and good having people in place when they turn up for their uh, meal or whatever. But by the time they've had three or four drinks, that might become a bit more of a challenge. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, definitely. I can see that. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, three very different perspectives there. Um, I've just, I've had a, so I've had a couple of questions through, um, and there's one that's come through that I think will maybe be um, ideal for Harriet to start with. Um, so it's our, our businesses like, uh, like nail bars uh, able to open longer hours to accommodate the changes, and are the councils going to relax laws to, to support more outdoor eating? Um, so have you got any uh, any views on that? In terms of uh, opening hours, I mean, our Warrington bid is one of uh, a number of bids that's managed by Groundwork, who also look after Northwich. And we've been um, involved in conversations with different town centres and saying that actually this is an opportunity for a step change, really. This is the transformation period we're going in where actually for some towns it might be appropriate not to do the nine to five anymore. But perhaps shopping and uh, going to uh, health and beauty places, food and drink could be combined and could become more of a leisure offer. In our survey, you know, what people are looking forward to in terms of going back to the high street is not going to Boots to buy a packet of tights. What they really are looking forward to is the experiential. So in our survey, it echoes what Stephen was saying. Um, over 50% of people are hungry to come back for hospitality and Warrington has a changing offer in terms of its food and drink. So what people miss most is having a coffee with their mates, going to a restaurant or pub for a meal, um, meeting their friends for coffee and 40% said they miss going to a bar or a pub and what they would welcome as more outdoor spaces, more street food vending and, and, um, and those kind of events. So that I was quite surprised. I did not think people would, would be looking forward to coming back to that. So in terms of the nail bars and the salons and those uh, service industries, we are looking actively for how we can provide support to those SMEs on the high street. So you may not know that the government's announced £50 million pounds worth of funding across the UK for recovery of the high street fund. In Warrington, that amounts to about £185,000 to support SMEs on the high street directly in terms of their um, sustainability and success. So we need to know what sort of support they would like. And we have a some engagement work going on over the next couple of weeks. We have a questionnaire out there um, asking people what help they do need. And then in terms of the outdoor spaces, working really closely with um, public health, um, with public protection, with transport, with the people that look after the high streets and how we can um, kind of um, make more spaces outside of uh, restaurants and units for people to eat outside but also this is an opportunity again with transformation to escalate some of those priorities that people said were important before all this happened and that's about creating a, a brighter cleaner greener town centre that people want to spend more time in that's what's come back from our survey and that was always in strategy anyway so this is an opportunity to put pedestrians first to put cycling first and create a whole new vibe for the town centre so whilst it has its challenges there are also great opportunities for change okay thank you um and if people want to find out about that i take it they they can contact um uh warrington bed direct or 
Yeah, we, they can contact me direct. We'll also be contacting businesses ourselves. And that's not just bid levy payers. These are all businesses in the town centre, small or large, that are going through this at the moment. Because even, even those little the tiddlers that aren't even big enough to pay a levy are all very important in the makeup of the town centre. We can't afford to lose them. Otherwise, it just becomes a bland place with big yeah. global brands. The independents are really important right now. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Katie, are you, uh, are you, I, uh, I, I've got a question here for yourself. Um, obviously massive challenges there, uh, for you, for, for you. And you've already told us, uh, told us about that. Um, the strict hygiene rules as well, um, that have to be followed. Um, you're having to reduce the number of clients. Uh, people will be worried about it. Are you are you able to? How are you communicating this to your customers and your employees, uh, or, or how or have you are you having challenges with this? Well, at the moment, our industry hasn't actually had any formal guidance from the government. So other industries have had um, released as they've been able to reopen things that they have to put in place. We haven't had that yet. So the Federation of Hair and Beauty, who we would follow, will drip feed exactly what it is that we have to do. And then obviously from there, it will be things that we choose to put in place as well. And I think somebody, I think it was yourself uh, or Steve mentioned before, some of it is about Oh, I suppose overkill in some sense to make sure that even if we don't need everything that we just keep going and making sure we've got everything we possibly can in place so for us masks um, gloves in the line of work that we do obviously we're always touching people's hands anyway and we're using tools we sanitize and sterilize everything anyway but it's a step further than that that all the desks see. and it's taken away for us all the different areas that clients touch we've had to take away um, seating areas for example now at the moment until we have the formal guidelines we haven't form uh, sort of articulated it to our teams properly uh, we need to get them back in off furlough for that and we need to have a period of time where we go through the training with them uh, make sure that everybody's on the same wavelength with what has to be done between each client in terms of communicating with clients we're doing that regularly we use social media for everything we've got the we use a booking system online booking system um, we need to try and push as many of our clients now to use that obviously we still have some of our probably more of our older ladies who don't use it but the booking system has created a, a section for us which means clients self-declare when they the day that they're due in that they've not had any um symptoms they're asked they're reminded by the booking system to self-declare and then also we're not because we've got no waiting area uh, there is a button for us to press which actually says we're ready for you to enter the salon now so there will be a period of empty trading time where we have to let one lady leave clean everywhere down and then we'll press a button and let the next client know that they're ready to enter the building obviously this is all going to be um well trial and error i suppose from when we first opened the first few days i'm guessing it's going to be a bit chaotic trying to communicate with people our line of work is as much about uh, the social side you know some ladies come into our salon and that is their social life they come in they don't go out a lot of other places they come in for a natter we've got clients who have made lifelong friends sat next to each other having the nails done so trying to re-educate everybody that more it's more now about nails and that social side of things is just gonna have to come slowly I think as we prepare to reopen so that we hit the ground running it's mm. a big challenge there has anybody, uh, any of the other panellists, uh, got anything to add to that that may be of help? I think, I think the management of time is going to be crucial when you've got reduced um, numbers. Now, demand will dictate that the customer is going to be a little more um, able to take on differences to what they might have remembered. So, for instance, I'm not saying for a second that Katie wants to do this. But she might decide that on certain days a week, she's open from 6.30 in the morning. Or there might be later nights, she may already do this. But whatever's possible there, we're talking in the restaurants about saying, for instance, restaurants, cafes, making sure that obviously everything's booked, because then that makes sure that you don't have this collision of queues. 
but also making sure that there's an allocation of time so that we can say previously, we might have said, well, it's your table for the night. The restaurant industry and the, and, and, and the pub industry is concerned about the less tables. But if you look at it, that actually Monday to Thursday across certainly Cheshire, these are periods when people aren't very busy. Fridays and Saturdays, they're virtually full all the time. So once they get full, it's their job to push those other things. And at the moment, every day is a Saturday, isn't it? And certainly until it all becomes normal and we all go back to work again. So getting people to understand that there are plenty of availability at other times that they may not want, and it's not going to be possible. And that communication to say, if you want our business to continue, our regular customers, then you're going to have to work with us a little bit here and work with the times we've got available. We're doing a six till eight sitting and an eight till 10 sitting. And I realize loads might want the eight till 10, but you might have to take the six till eight. Now, I saw people queuing for Kentucky Fried Chicken at 1030 in the morning. I can't think what meal that was, but it kind of shows the desire <laughs> to work themselves around something that works so that they can get what they want and i think in this period while there isn't a normal normal the new norm is going to see us work with what we've got and don't forget that desire it's so strong from people there i just think we've got to put it out there and say this is what we've got and you may find particularly if you take on that cue bunk with the ordering you're going to need a lesser member of staff than you did need previously because no one's going to take orders you just need someone to take the delivery out to them so with that and furloughing staff where you can have some back who are working and some who are furloughed you might be able to string this out longer and actually be profitable during that period and that's the big concern for people oh my goodness i won't be able to be profitable the people who've got the biggest issue are those who have got bars cocktail bars and things like that they rely heavily on that crowded atmosphere and noisiness, et cetera. And that's very difficult. We haven't got an answer for that yet. But I think for just about everybody else, there is a way, be confident, look at it as a challenge. Over the period of the last 30 years that I've been involved in hospitality, we've always had challenges and we've always found an answer. So just be positive, there's loads of help. You guys are doing a great job. Marketing Cheshire are doing a great job. The various bids around the place are doing a brilliant job around um, Chester and Warrington, etc. So I just think be positive mm. and reach out for all the help that's there. Great. Yeah, I think we do have, thank you. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, there's something from Harriet. I think she's, Harriet, would you like to ask the question about SMEs? Um, want to know is, after some feedback? Um, well, yeah, in terms of putting together this um, application really for this 185,000 that we can um, put in, back into the recovery of the high street. What sort of support do you think um, we can offer to the many um, food and drink establishments that we've got in Warrington? It is, it, I've always been amazed about that, the number of people at lunchtime and after work that have got that extra spend to be able to be in town having coffee and eating. Um, so what are those businesses going to need in terms of support? Um, if we were to draw down funding, what sort of things will they need help with? Harriet, um, we did a survey of our, our um, stakeholders recently, and the biggest issue they all have is around restocking, because the time when the industry was forced to close was unfortunately the worst time. They make money at Christmas time that pays the bills for October and November. January and February are always a disaster. March, it starts to be about break even. So they've had two loss making months. They then go into March when they're expecting to start making money and it's all closed and they can't pay for the things that they've got. The suppliers themselves are in trouble because they're owed millions by restaurants and pubs who couldn't pay them. And so when they go and say, we're going to be open now and we need new product, well, you already owe me five grand unless I can get some money back into the system. So if someone's weekly take is, let's say it's 2,000 pounds, I'm using silly figures here, you would expect about 400 pounds of that to be the cost of their product, right? So if someone provided them with 400 quid, so they could say, look, I'll pay that towards my account. Can I get my first week's worth of stock? Once they get trading, there's cash in the system. We've got to find a way to get cash into the system so that the suppliers aren't being asked to carry the burden of the restocking. And that was the biggest concern for all of them. That and a little bit about retraining 
if you're going to bring staff in and you're not making money, someone's going to have to pay them. So if we're going to have to teach them new operating procedures, we've probably got three or four days because it's important that retraining. If you don't retrain them correctly, someone could die. That's how important. It is. So we've got a cost issue there as well, which is not going to be easy to do. But I think working around furlough, they might be able to handle that one. But the stock issue is the biggest concern for the hospitality trade. Thanks. Yeah, but Heard that. And Katie, do you have anything to add to that or would you echo that? Yeah, uh, our stock isn't perishable. So yeah, our stock is sat there gathering dust at the moment. <laughs> which needs a good clean. Um, for us, we have had to um, use the grant that we received to make changes around the salon. Uh, we've had to buy screens. We've had to, we didn't, would you believe, we didn't have hot water in our commercial premises we've had to put hot water in obviously now um that has left us with a couple of thousand pounds to pay our rent in full which we have to do and my obviously biggest concern for us is we're going to hit july end of july and it's paying that first full month's rent when we have been trading because the grant will have run out and it's whether we've accrued enough money in that period of time to keep up with our rent obligations. Um, we don't quite know what's happening with the furlough yet. I think I have at least one member of staff I'll keep on furlough for a while while we get organised. But yeah, that's our biggest thing is you know, I can work all the hours God sends. We already work long hours anyway. We work long hours and we work late nights and early morning. There's only so many hours obviously in the day. My biggest concern and a lot of uh, hairdressers I know and other salons is if we can only do half the clients, but we've still got to pay <laughs> full rent, where are we going to stand? Um, but, you know, everybody's in the same boat. Uh, we're, all, we're all in that same position, aren't we, I suppose? Yeah, yeah. And I think just already, you know, some of the things that we've noted down and been discussed, it, yeah, it, it, it's definitely about sharing these innovations and these, these ideas um, I mean, just quickly, it's, it's, these, uh, the, the UV light, that's already been picked up by Katie. Um, I'm sure there's, there's going to be a lot of interest as well. Uh, Harriet, any other innovations there that, uh, that people have heard about that we could spread the word about uh, that might be useful to businesses? Mark, not so much an innovation, and I'm sure a number of people are aware of it. I'm, I'm not one that advocates debt necessarily. Um, however, if you believe you have a thriving business and you are worried about a shortfall before you get up to speed, the current bounce back loan is as good a vehicle as I've seen anywhere. Most banks prior to this um, wouldn't have lent you a bean because they're just not interested in anybody who... Uh, the only way to get a loan off a bank was if you had more money than you actually wanted in the first place. However, that aside, this bounce back loan, first of all, is very, very easy for anybody who hasn't done it. It is um, a loan where you can put down what your next year's revenue is. You get 25% of that. And of that, you don't pay anything back on that loan for a year. And only then does the interest start accruing at what is 2.5%. So it is the cheapest money available anywhere. It's backed by the government. All the banks do it. Doesn't matter whether you're banking with Starling or HSBC, they process it incredibly quickly. And it is extremely good value. Now, I'm not recommending that everybody gets into debt, but if you know that your business is profitable and you think that you're gonna need a little bit of money, if you put down that you only want 10,000 pounds and you put down that your turnover is 50,000 pounds, and you don't use that £10,000 when you're due to make your first payment at any time. You can pay it back in full and there's absolutely no penalty as well. It's as good a loan scheme as I've ever seen. And I would highly recommend everybody looks into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any, uh, any sort of final remarks or, or questions from the panel? No. Okay, well, we're pretty much there now, um, just tipped over the 45 minutes, um, so I'll just wrap up. Um, before I do that, I'm uh, working on a, a really, really uh, impactful project that I really wanted to make sure that you know about uh, and, and anybody that's listening, um, it's especially uh, useful for furlough staff um, and, and people that are uh, maybe in a different situation, working from home, for example, may have some additional time 
things aren't aren't normal. It is. Um, it's all about skills training. So we have uh, funding up to 100% of the fu funding cost of training available at the moment for SMEs right across um, uh, Cheshire and Warrington. So if you're a business or an individual working for a business and you're looking uh, to do some training to upskill yourself, um, you might really be in a, in, a, in a difficult situation at work and you really need some digital skills or whatever it might be, um, please, please contact us because this is a really genuine opportunity to access quality training, not just short courses, but real quality upskill training for you and your business uh, and your employees. So do, do get in touch with us about that and, and please spread the word as well. Um, so yeah, as I said, if, if uh, you do have questions, I'm sure that there'll be quite a few questions. We're going to be posting this up on the website, um, but uh, just Google the Growth Hub, Cheshire Growth Hub, Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, you've also got the, the contact details there for Stephen. And, and and Harriet at uh, Warrington Bid, again, very easy, very good websites on there. Just Google them, Google up that. Um, accelerate training, please uh, get in touch with myself, or you'll, you'll find our details on the website. Uh, and any other questions, get them through to us. So we, we're here to support, and, and I really uh, wanted to thank you, uh, Stephen, Katie, and Harriet. That's really really interesting stuff, and, and great to see get get the insider because we're on the outside, we want to know what's happening uh, uh, on the ground. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for, for joining us today. And um, that brings us to a close of our, our webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.